Well, I wasn't so very young. I was 28 years old when I arrived in Oroville in 1970. And um, I come from a family of teachers, but I never wanted to be a teacher. Uh, nevertheless, when I left the university, uh, I found that I, I had to do some teaching. So when I arrived to join Oroville, in those days, uh, there was an application form to be filled in, and that application form would be sent to the mother in the ashram with a photograph of the person who was applying. And uh, when that form was filled in and you had your photograph, there were three different people to whom it could be given. They were called the Comité Administratif de Roville. There were three people. One of them was the mother's son, Monsieur André, and another was Navajat, one of the disciples, who was the um, chairman of the Shrelbindor Society, which was the um, in charge of the whole project of Oroville at that time. And uh, then another person was Roger Angers, who the mother had appointed as the architect of Oroville. And um, somebody advised me that I should take my form and meet Roger Angers. And uh, so I gave it to him and he had a look at it. And then he immediately said, oh, you have worked with children. Uh, mother is pressing us that we have to start a school in Oroville. You can do that, he said. And because he wanted me to do that, he took me to see the mother at his time. He used to meet her every morning. And um, one, one morning shortly after I arrived, in those days we were not allowed to come out to stay in Oroville until the mother had given permission. We had to, they made arrangements for us to stay in Pondicherry. It was quite strictly controlled who lives in Oroville. Mother had to decide. So he took me to see mother at his time. He went in in front of me and he must have uh, given her some background about me. And um, I, inwardly I had been in touch with the mother for some time since I heard about Shirobindo and mother uh, in my country. And I thought that I had many things that I should tell her about my coming to Oroville at that time. And um, so I was prepared for a conversation. <laughs> but uh, before I went in, I was told, we do not speak. Uh, you just uh, be in front of mother and let her look into your eyes and then she will know everything that she needs to know about you. So that's what I did. And uh, somehow at the end of her looking at me, I knew that it is time to go. She gave me a rose and I got up and I went away. And I had really forgotten why I was there. <laughs> Roger came running after me and told me that um, mother says yes, you can go to Oroville and uh, you can work in the school. So that very day itself I was able to come to Oroville to Aspiration 
It was the first major community. There were some small scattered communities here and there, but that was the first major community. And they were expecting me. Somebody came out to meet me. And I was relieved to find that I did not have to start a school. I'd been thinking that uh, Mother knows who I am. She's looked at me. She must know what I can do and what is the right thing for me to do and what I cannot do. And if she asks me to do something, then surely she will give me the capacity to do it. But I was relieved to find that I did not have to start a school because there were already a couple of young people there who were holding classes for the children who lived in that community, in aspiration, young children. But shortly after that, in December 1970, um, the first official school in Oroville was opened, Aspiration School, opened on the 16th of December 1970. And I, along with those other young people and other people, uh, we were there on that first day to welcome the children. When the school was opened, the mother had been asked what would be the languages it, that would be taught in the school. This was an important question because when our children arrived, the first 35 children arrived, and we were perhaps 12 or 15 young adults to meet them, perhaps we had 50 different languages between us. So <laughs> the whole of the first year of the school was spent in finding ways of communication. But she had said that um, English would be taught as the international language, Tamil as the local language, French, she didn't give any particular reason for French, but French is the medium of instruction in the ashram school. And then she said, a simplified Sanskrit because Sanskrit should become the language of India, the national language of India. A simplified Sanskrit, she later explained, it means that there are words of Sanskrit origin in all the languages of India. So it doesn't, shouldn't be a classical scholarly kind of Sanskrit. It should be a Sanskrit that everybody can understand, whatever part of India they come from. Well, one short thing which I could say is that following a long tradition in India, Sri Aurobindo and the mother tell us that higher than the human mind, there is a, a wisdom which knows how things should be. And that in nature, there is a will which is much stronger than our human, ignorant human will. So she has said, it is that wisdom and that will that we want to serve. We want to offer ourselves to serve that higher wisdom and that deeper will which is in nature. And in order to do that,
some kind of self-discipline, voluntary self-discipline, will help us in that effort. Some psychological self-discipline. So that psychological self-discipline is called yoga. In many countries, yoga is understood as a series of exercises which are very good for your body, perhaps. Um, in India, it is known that that kind of yoga is one kind of yoga which has been uh, developed as a way of preparing the body um, so that it will uh, support or at least not be an interference if we want to follow these higher psychological self-discipline. The body should be calm and under control and able to support the inrush of higher energies and uh, so on. So Hatha Yoga is a preparation for that. Breathing exercises, pranayama, are a help for that. But the goal of all Indian yogas is, um, we can say, liberation. That is to say, liberation from this limited, ignorant state in which we human beings find ourselves. And that liberation should come through union. Actually, the word yoga means union. So, union of the individual with that higher wisdom and will, that omnipresent reality of which we are a small part, and because we are a small part of it, each one of us, we are connected to the origin of everything. And uh, if we would like to serve that higher wisdom and that deeper will, we can try to put ourselves in contact with that origin. One of the unique aspects of, I believe it's a unique aspect of Sri Aurobindo's teaching and the one which appealed to me when I first heard about him is the idea that evolution is not finished. It's quite logical when you think about it. Why should evolution be finished? And yet we human beings, we tend to think that, oh, we are the summit of evolution and it might not go any further. If um, the materialists, if the, the material scientists are right, who say that everything is the result of chance, random mutations, then it could be like that. But Sri Aurobindo has shown in a very uh, interesting way in his book, The Life Divine, that this means if we make it evolution, we say like, like that, it means it's just a label. We haven't explained at all how out of that primitive plasma that we are told existed at the beginning, immediately after the Big Bang, that this complex matter that we have now could have evolved, and how out of this complex matter, uh, living and conscious beings could have evolved. These are mysteries, no? Uh, scientists, of course, are trying to replicate the material conditions under which life might have arisen, but that doesn't explain what life is and where it has come from. So the ancient Indian teaching is that life and mind are involved in matter, that they are inherent in matter from before the Big Bang. The possibility of life 
and consciousness and of a higher consciousness we can say what we call spirit or that higher wisdom that, that possi those possibilities are gradually evolving unfolding and that process is not finished so when we look at the world around us and somebody tells us oh there's a higher wisdom regulating all this we think well we human beings actually we could do better it's such a mess no but we can't do better we are not able to do better with all our wish to do things better we are not able to do it because of the limitations of our consciousness and the the thought the thing that appealed to me was that if we want to do it it is possible to reach a higher level of consciousness and with the help of that higher level of consciousness we can act on the conditions of our world and help to change it so that is an important part of what Sri Aurobindo's yoga, the integral yoga. I think what we have to, tr to do is to try to find that part of our own being which is connected with the origin. Some part of us has accepted this adventure of unconsciousness, of uh, going through this experience of being cut off, forgetting our origin, of uh, becoming involved in this world of matter and to gradually uh, go through this adventure of rediscovering who we really are and what we really are. And um, to the extent that we're able to find the truth of our own individuality, we can reunite with that origin. That is what spiritual people in all countries, in all ages, have been trying to do. But, because they didn't have this evolutionary perspective, they had the idea that uh, it's impossible to change this world the way that it is. We have to become fit, that we can rise to a higher level of consciousness, a heaven, or a world, or a nirvana, a state, and then we will leave this world. And Sri Aurobindo says, what a pity. All these great souls, they have undertaken all these efforts, and then they have gone away. They could, they could do it. And they've left the world just as it is. But what was the intention of this involution in the first place? Uh, wasn't there perhaps the intention for a fulfillment in the material world. So if that is what we are aiming for, we still have a long way to go on our adventure and our journey. And then it would be good if people who uh, believe in that uh, higher harmony, if something in you has given you the conviction, the experience, that there is a oneness, there is a higher knowledge, there is a higher state, you would accept to stay in the world and be part of the world and to make a connection, a living connection between the two, between the higher state and the present state. So Oroville has been created to give us that opportunity after all the experiments that Shobindo and Mother did in their ashram, they felt uh, that it was time to spread the experiment in an international township which would welcome people 
who were willing to make that effort towards a better future for the whole of humanity and for the whole earth. We call it the Matri Mandir. It means the temple of the mother. And it's called that because in India, the creative principle, the principle that gives birth to everything new, no? is the mother. So this is the temple of that creative evolutionary force that is working for the higher future for the earth. And inside in that chamber which has been offered to us as a place, Mother said, to learn to concentrate, has been placed this symbol, the globe, the crystal globe, with a ray of light falling on it, constantly unwavering ray of light falling on it. So Mother has said two things about the crystal. She said, it is the symbol of the future realization. And she said, it's the object of concentration. So if you are learning to concentrate, not only your mind, but your energies, it's helpful to have something to concentrate on. Hmm? So there is this beautiful, perfect form, full of light, that we can concentrate on to gather our energies and keep them concentrated. But what is the symbol of the future realization? I explain it to myself like this. That is a perfectly pure crystal. It means every molecule inside that globe is flawless, it's perfect. It's in its perfect place. If any of them were in the wrong places, there would be a flaw in the crystal and it wouldn't be able to receive the light like that. The, it, receives the light from above and it spreads it, it lights up the whole room. No? So that is the future realization that we want. All of us want or need to have every part of our being perfect and pure and just in the way it should be, receiving the light from above which helps us to be pure and perfect and spreading it all around. And then the whole world could be like that crystal, receiving the higher light, spreading it, everything in harmony, uh, every individual within the whole feeling in their right place and their right relation with all the other parts. considered it an important part of his work to restate, he said, the Vedic knowledge and then he added to that the knowledge which he himself acquired by his sadhana and he wrote a great many books, there are two big shelffuls of books on different topics, restating that knowledge in a way that would be accessible, he said, to the modern mind because in the process of evolution our mind has also evolved. It's difficult for us to go back to the time of the Vedas or even the Upanishads or the Gita and think like people thought at that time. 
but there's something in those old writings which has something to tell us today, the insights that those highly developed people had at that time. So he undertook that work of restating. And most of his books, including his essays on the Gita, his writings about the Veda and the Upanishad, his writings on social psychology, on history, on uh, all kinds of different topics, even on poetry and so on. And these are addressed to our reason because he says man is a mental being and at our present stage of development um, the reason is the highest faculty that we have and if we want to change anything in our lives, in our nature, uh, if our reason is convinced about it, uh, that will help us. Now, if the reason doesn't understand what we are trying to do, it will be very difficult. But some of the ancient scriptures are not addressed to the reason. The Vedas and the Upanishads are not addressed to the reason. And that's because our whole being is not satisfied by reason alone. People can tell you all kinds of good reasons why you should do this or that and you have to say yes, after all they are right. But you don't feel fully convinced. You know, there are other parts of our being that need to be satisfied. And perhaps through poetry, those other parts of our being, our aesthetic parts, our imagination, our uh, feelings of love and delight and adoration, they can be touched. They won't be touched just by the reason. He took this traditional story of Savitri and Satyavan and uh, he worked at it first as an exercise for himself. What Sri Aurobindo and Mother were doing was contacting the higher levels and trying to bring them into action in our world. Sri Aurobindo was a poet, so one of the ways that he did that was through his poetry. So he said that every time he was able to reach a higher uh, realization, a new level with, that he was established in a higher consciousness, he rewrote what he had written before and tried to bring everything up to the new level. He did it first as an exercise to see how far his yogic consciousness could be used for writing poetry. But somehow in the process over 30 odd years um, he has produced this amazing poem. Finally in the last five, six years of his life he uh, tried to finish it. He brought it to a certain level of incomplete completion. It was not fully complete, but still we can read it as a whole. And it is the mother who has said that she feels that this is the vehicle of Sri Aurobindo's message. All the other books she said are the preparation, but this is the message. So this book is regarded with a great deal of veneration and respect and is being read by people connected with Sri Aurobindo all over the world. But here in Oroville at a certain point in 1994 it was suggested that we should not just read it, we should really study it. We should make an effort to try to grasp what this wonderful poem has to tell us. And this place, Savitri Bhavan, has grown out of that. 
uh, effort. Gradually we feel with repeated readings and studyings, we're beginning to understand something. And for, to understand Savitri better, one can study many other things. One, one can study particularly uh, the other writings of Sri Aurobindo, the wonderful talks of the mother where, who puts things so simply and plainly. And one can study English literature and one can study the Vedas and uh, one can uh, Greek and Latin classical mythology. Uh, all these kind of things uh, will help us in our understanding. And people have tried also to relate to this poem in other ways, by painting, for example, or composing music, or through dramas, or uh, dance dramas. So all those kind of activities are welcomed here also. The way is, if we are interested in doing that, whatever small contact we can have is only an enrichment. No? So, you don't have to understand everything all at once. Your mind can't do it, your brain can't do it. But if you read with aspiration, and you want to understand, um, it's very clear that your brain starts to make the necessary connections and your mind starts to develop and your consciousness develops and gradually you understand more and more and more. And if then you really try to apply that understanding in your life, you will find your understanding grows much more. You will see what are the difficulties and the obstacles um, to change. And you will understand more about this um, field of work that you have been given your own self. You can't really change anything else in this world except just this material that you've been given. But this material, as you work on it, as you allow the higher forces to work on it, then it can enlarge and widen and maybe uh, influence other people and other things also. Well, it's very interesting that you are recognizing something meaningful to you. Many people are baffled by these pictures. The, the theme of each of these pictures has been given by the mother. She, she was trained as an artist, but by the time that uh, these pictures were started, this painting of this series in 1961, she was no longer painting but she took a young disciple in the ashram, Huta, who had no training as an artist at all, nothing. No. But mother must have seen some possibility or receptivity in her. There were many artists in the ashram, and mother said she had tried something with them, but she had not uh, got the results she needed. So perhaps the fact that Huta didn't have any preconceived ideas about what art should be or what a picture should look like. Perhaps that gave mother some greater possibility of working. And you will have seen there that she says how they did it. They would read some lines. They would concentrate silently together. And then some image would become clear to the mother and she would make a sketch and explain to Huta what she wanted and Huta would go to her studio which had been prepared by the mother and the mother's force put there and then she would prepare the painting and uh, to do that she had to create a sketch 
and uh, mother sometimes would correct that sketch before allowing her to start putting the colors. And when they had um, completed the whole series, I think by the middle of 1965, mother asked to see them all again. And then she made Huta repaint many of them. So uh, many of the early, all the paintings of book one, we have them in two versions, um, the original version and the second one. And mother said, I was trying to see how the consciousness can act. And she said, if we can see if we compare, you know, what, were done, what was done in this short time without any formal training. It's really very, very interesting. And of course, mother was not trying to show the world as it is. There are plenty of artists doing that. She said, we, it's, there's a, another reality which is much closer to the truth, to the truth of things. And it's that one we are trying to show you. In, and of course, they used many different methods. Some of them are symbolic, some of them are abstract, some of them have pictures which seem connected with the verses. Um, in the legend part of the of the poem, the story of Satyavan and Savitri, then they're more like illustrations to a fairy tale. You know? But the very, very interesting ones, you can see some there, are the book of yoga, and then the later books, which are all about Savitri's inner journey. Mm -hmm. And then there's an earlier book, book two and book three, about Asvapati, her father, his inner journey. So these tell us many things about the inner worlds, or about our world. As I understand it, we have, Mother has created this place, she's concentrated, a focus, focused some energy here. You have perhaps seen this painting, The Spirit of Orville. No? She's focused something here. A power, an influence that will speed up evolution in people who come under that influence. And it's a field of activity. It's a, we are supposed to be building a city, so there's a huge choice of activities where each individual can find all the opportunities that they need for their own self-discovery and their own self-expression. And she has told us not to regard this as something for ourselves only. The aim of Auroville, the two aims she mentioned, human unity and peace on earth. And of course many of the people here also are very, very concerned about the, the future of the earth as a planet. You know, a, a lot of efforts have been made here in the fifth field of what we could call ecology, a, a better relationship between human beings and nature. So that, uh, what I feel, it's a field of opportunity for us, of exploration. We've been set very, very high ideals. We've been given very, very difficult conditions, very challenging conditions. Today the conditions are a lot easier than they were in the beginning, but they are still challenging, perhaps not so much materially now, but psychologically they are still very, very challenging. Because people are coming here from all kinds of backgrounds, 
different countries, different cultural backgrounds, and most of them are consciously leaving something and coming here and looking for an opportunity for something that feels truer and better to them. But all this is not in harmony. All these things clash, all these different expectations and aspirations and all the rest of it. There's a harmonizing force which somehow seems to keep us connected but in this connection there's a lot of clash going on and um, a beautiful image has been given for this by one of our Oravillian sisters. As she said it's like one of those machines when you want to polish gemstones. You put all the rough stones in the, the barrel with some grit you know, and you turn it and the people, the stones polish each other. She said that is what we are doing, we are polishing each other. We hopefully many beautiful unique gems will come. We are not supposed to be all the same. Human unity doesn't mean everybody thinking the same and wearing the same clothes and eating the same food and uh, not at all, not at all, not at all. Each of those divine seeds which has come is unique and in the course of evolution it will become more and more and more unique and it's those unique gemstones, uh, those fully polished, perfect, uh, everyone different that is needed to create the new creation, the wonderful harmony of all these colors and flavors and perfumes and musical notes and so on. That would be the fulfillment. And I think it's interesting that um, all the religions and all the ideals, even the socialist ideal you can say, they dreamed of a state of perfect fulfillment for every individual in a perfect society. No? It's as if that dream is coded into every human being. Some of us think that, oh, it was in the past and now we have fallen and so on. But I think it's in the future and that future is drawing all of us towards it. Those future possibilities that we are each of us carrying within us and that future harmony that's been envisaged by that higher wisdom and which that deeper will in nature is driving towards that, uh, that new creation. Yes, it expresses something like that. But we seem to have set ourselves an impossible task with this wonderful image. Um, it's, uh, from the point of view of town planning, it's an extremely difficult kind of plan to realize. So we've, the, the challenges are there, all the challenges. And one thing more I should mention, you know, that from this evolutionary point of view, Sri Aurobindo explained to us that so far the whole history of humanity has been dominated by what he called the overmind. It's a highest form of mind, but it suffers from the quality, the, the characteristic of mind which is separation, division. Mind divides, analyzes, explores things separately. It's almost impossible for mind to see things really as an organic whole. We can put things together like a jigsaw puzzle 
And in fact, our mind is always trying to do that. You know? But he says the next uh, power after mind that would come, he calls it supermind, beyond mind. This has that power of harmonization, of creating oneness, harmony between many, many, many different elements. And so that was what he devoted his whole life and the mother devoted her whole life to bringing that power into operation in the earth atmosphere. And that's the unique contribution that Shilbindo has made among all the great teachers. No, it's, it's a city. A city is not a village and it's not a monastery. It's a city and people can go in and come out and move around and it should have all the richness of a city. So, but people should try to understand what is special about this city. What is, why is this a city which is different from any other city that has ever been? That is important to know. It's not just a place to come because here there are certain freedoms that you might not have or certain possibilities that you might not have wherever you come from. Uh, really, uh, one should come here with the aspiration to accelerate one's own personal evolution and through that contribute to the further evolution of the whole of humanity. And that's not something we can do ourselves. We can only put ourselves under the influence of this higher wisdom and this deeper will and try to serve that. And in that way we shall progress. Perhaps we could say that all this sounds very utopian and we look around at the condition of the world today. Uh, terrible things are happening to people all over the globe. The earth itself seems to be in danger. So this handful of people in South India with their big ideas. Um, what are they doing really, practically, to make the world a better place? Mother, of course, welcomed everybody who has the goodwill, she said, to work for a better tomorrow. But some of us feel that the way that Shobindo and Mother have shown us is the only way that can really work. Everything that anybody does out of love for humanity, any wish to serve is something positive in their own development and it will, have, it will be accepted and will have some impact. But if really there could be a society of people who were consciously undertaking this psychological self-discipline and living it out in their life, and in all, it, they could create a new kind of society a society that's devoted to higher evolution. So, it doesn't have to be here. It could happen anywhere, 
but this space has been created for that. It's the opportunity that's offered. So sometimes I think it's like a kindergarten for the, the souls to come here and play together and grow. And like children, we quarrel and we fight all human difficulties you will experience in some way here. In that way, we shall grow and grow. And uh, in the beginning, in the early days of Oroville, they used to speak about it as a university. A universe city and as a university. So if we can grow up, one day perhaps it will be that university. And the mother said, the city the earth needs, you know, that can show Give some concrete examples of better ways to do things. And, and of course there's a kind of contagion between all the elements in this whole that we are. So any real progress that is made in any individual will have its impact on the whole. But if there's a lot of individuals together and they all are progressing, then um, I sometimes use the image of a, a piece of paper. Uh, you want to set it on, you want to get a flame going. No? You can focus the rays of the sun onto one spot of your piece of paper. No? It means that on that spot uh, the molecules will get heated up and they will start to move and they, uh, eventually there will be so much heat and the whole piece of paper will burn up. So, Oroville could be a place like that where we are given, given the opportunity to heat up and if really we catch flame then it could help the whole earth to catch flame that flame of aspiration towards a higher life.